This is the Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer brand and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Rob Keeve is the co-founder and CEO of the pioneer global e-commerce platform, Flow Commerce, which is a turnkey platform for brands to really go global, converting their international demand into sales. And I think it's really important to underscore how this industry is a global one. Everyone has to understand and then act upon how to get their products sold online, not just in their home country, but in hundreds of countries all over the world. So you know, suddenly you look up and you figure that um, there are many complexities about doing that. And really, Rob has thought about all of those complexities. And I'm really very enthusiastic about having a chat with him about that here. Let's get started. Welcome, Rob, to the Safari. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Great honor. So tell me, Rob, you know, you have been doing uh, technology and been in the retail side of technology for a very long time. Talk to me a little bit about your background, high level, so everyone understands a little bit where, where we're coming from, um, because obviously, uh, as they heard in the introduction, you're very much solving a certain problem in the sort of global consumer and retail industry, um, but there's some foundational parts to why we are where we are in, in your life. Yes, absolutely. So what brought me to the point where I was a co-founder of Flow, my current business, is originally back in the UK, I was in venture capital investing in retail tech uh, and other online businesses. I moved from there into my first startup, uh, which was a customer feedback tool for brands and retailers called Fizzback. I built and grew that over many years and eventually sold that in 2011. And in 2015, founded Flow with my co-founder, who was the co-founder of Guild Group. And it was our combined experience around the challenges that retail and brands have and growing global that was the catalyst behind us setting up Flow Commerce. So if you're a CEO listening to this, uh, this podcast and you've come uh, up a, uh, a, a learning curve of the 20th century maybe and, and now over the last 15 years of, of this, uh, or 19 years I guess, sorry, of this century we have been uh, experiencing sort of the best of the 20th century and the best of the 21st century models and once upon a time if you wanted to go international um, you would uh, figure out who in Dubai or in India or in Italy uh, is the best distributor distributor you'd partner with them uh, you would basically maybe you know, wholesale minus your goods to them uh, and you would you know set it and maybe forget it you probably shouldn't forget it but that's kind of how it went and it was hard to always be in front of these people because you'd have to travel all over the world which people tried to do um, so today that still happens and yes there are distributors all over the world if you want to go global and, and the the global brand thing for me we'll get to that later on but th those two words are so incredibly important um, you are solving a problem in the, let's say, digital world that we live in, uh, whereby you can add a bit of top spin, a lot of top spin even, to that global strategy, uh, particularly around e-commerce. So explain a little bit about what Flow is and what is the problem that you're solving. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I like that idea of top spin. We think that the era we're in at the moment is a fantastically exciting one one that didn't exist in the 20th century. Uh, the internet's been around now for a few decades, but the idea of really using it for global reach and global distribution, let alone global commerce, hasn't really existed until very recently. And now with the reach of social platforms, the reach of search, just online referral networks, 
consumers find brands from all over the world. And it gives brands of any size the opportunity to reach consumers in Sydney, through to Singapore, to London, Brussels, Rio, just as easily as Nike or Amazon. Uh, and so the problem that Flow is solving is how can you easy, easily, in a very turnkey way as a brand, solve all the challenges that you have of selling internationally? And we'll come on to talk about some of them. But how do you sell in local currency? Think about duties. How do you sell quickly, ship quickly and cheaply internationally? What about payments? What about customer service and returns? So brands of any shape and size, from the enormous to the small, all have these challenges. And we want to make it frictionless, hence flow, to be able to reach these consumers wherever they are. And do you therefore plug into various marketplaces around the world and 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 aid the brands, let's say an American brand, for example, uh, to understand who and how they should be working with certain people in China or India, or how how where does it start and where does it stop flow? So. We're a young startup, we're well-backed and we have many clients, but we're not yet a global phenomena. At the moment, our focus is helping brands online sell and market and sell and ship directly from their site. Often our clients are brands, and brands by definition, you'll know better than me, are brands who want to own the customer, focus on customer experience, want to have an amazingly branded entire funnel and supply chain and don't want to be commoditized. So often these very clients are very wary of the marketplaces because they feel they will commoditize what they offer. And so they're trying to direct traffic to their site. And that's what we do. We integrate into their site very simply to change everything so that in 200 countries, their US or UK or French site now looks local in 200 different countries. And so, you know, um, marketplaces, therefore, you know, what are the perils of marketplaces? Because some of them are massive and famous and wonderful and they take care of you but you know taking control of your own distribution and therefore your own website and how it feels all over the world is part of the problem you're solving it's it's taking back control once upon a time wholesale was you know the the opposite of control you, you, the way you looked in a in some store somewhere in the world uh even if it was down the street uh, in in you know down the street from your headquarters in in New York or San Francisco or Columbus or whatever it was, um, you know wholesale is is wholesale. So marketplace is a little bit maybe the wholesale of e-commerce, um, and therefore you're aiding people to bring back control to control their own website. Um, but what are the perils of of marketplaces? Everyone's obsessed with marketplaces. In fact, I spoke to last week Jenny Bike of Orchard Mile, and I love marketplaces. But, you know, they're not all created equal. So maybe maybe talk about the, the difficulties with dealing. Yeah, absolutely. So marketplaces are interesting because in different countries, they treat marketplaces very differently. You know, Amazon is by name a marketplace in the same way that Tmall in China is, in the same way Zalando in Germany is, but they behave very differently. Um, in China, Tmall is a necessity to get into the market. It's very hard to drive traffic to your own branded site. But in most other countries, consumers are used to visiting the mono brand site and don't feel, don't always do their shopping through marketplaces. The advantage of marketplaces, and I'm thinking also of the far fetchers of the world, is they have big spend to be able to consolidate the spend and drive traffic to their site and have an economy of scale for doing that and then can convert consumers. The challenge for the brand is that's no longer their brand experience. It's not the site or the brand personality that they've spent years building up. And they also lose a lot of margin in the process. So if the way a lot of brands are now starting to approach it is there's danger in working with the marketplaces, certainly the Amazons of the world, the risk of losing your own purchase data and sharing it with what could become a competitor is high. And now Amazon, I think, has 119 private label brands competing with their own marketplace sellers. Um, so the risks are even higher. So many brands will either shy away from it completely or use it very tactically to acquire customers, first-time customers, but then try to retain them on their own side. And what we do as we help brands go global is think about their global strategy and how they can end up owning the customer experience through their own site and their own supply chain. So if there's a leader of a brand listening to this, um, you have, I, I believe, five or six buckets that you feel that are your um, addressable topspin, uh, maybe. So, you know, 
maybe just so people hear them now, what are those five or six things that we'll probably deal with, which will be the, probably the, the main takeaways from, from our chat that we're about to have? Absolutely. So let me talk about that and maybe do a bit of a run up to um, what's happening. What are the pain points that these five buckets address? So when we analyze the top 300 full stack brands in the US, uh, I was surprised by how significant the international traffic is hitting their site. It's about a third. And from sometimes remarkable places you, that you wouldn't expect. Completely. Whenever we look at top 10 countries, I'm always surprised. I mean, Holland index is high, sometimes Peru, sometimes Israel, sometimes uh, Singapore. There are often surprises in that varies by brand. But if a third of the site traffic is hitting these sites, what's, uh, uns what is surprising is how little of that is converting into paying customers. And the reasons is, firstly, when they hit the site, the pricing is in the wrong currency. If it is in the right currency, it's not rounded. Uh, secondly, you've got challenges like product restrictions. You may be seeing products that you can't ship to your country, but you wouldn't know that. The second big bucket is around duties and tax. Many brands, if they're selling internationally, if they've never done this before, they may not be selling what's known as DAP or DDP, which is duties prepaid on the site. Mm. If they aren't, the big pain point for the consumer is they've now got a carrier on their doorstep, probably three weeks later, charging them $35 for duty and tax that they had no idea was in addition to the purchase price. And yeah, the, a gift with purchase, you know? Yeah, exactly. And an extra £10 administration fee for the, for the pleasure of it. Uh, so that's a terrible customer experience. And we'll come on to talk about lifetime value and, and the detriment of doing it poorly. Uh, that's a big challenge. And then shipping, payments, and customer service are the other challenges in purchasing cross-border. So when we think about this is how can we help brands do this seamlessly and in a turnkey way, it's making sure, one, that the product pages are highly localized. Local currency, nicely rounded, duty and tax displayed, products that are restricted, suppressed, um, duty sometimes included in the product price. In the UK, as you know, we're used to seeing sales tax included in the product price. Mm -hmm. So ensuring these kind of small obstacle things around pricing are dealt with, so it feels local. The second bucket is what's called classification or harmonization mm -hmm. to ensure that duties and tax are properly calculated so the consumer experience is good and feels local instead of terrible. Uh, thirdly, we have a shipping component to ensure that consumers can get international parcels quickly and cheaply instead of what currently usually happens is untrackable, who knows when you'll get it, maybe a month later it turns up unexpected on the doorstep. So you have partnerships with logistics, uh, 3PLs or, 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 or international shipping guys? Exactly. So we have relationships and deep integrations into express shippers and standard shippers who may be cheaper but take slightly longer. In some cases, are there sort of consolidators who, to get into some markets, you have to consolidate in the United States and then go into that market? Or? Absolutely. There could be consolidators, aggregators, and in some markets, you want a local shipper because they clear customs more efficiently. China is a classic example where if you use a Chinese carrier, you'll clear customs much quicker and problem-free in a way you wouldn't if you were using a Western one. Got it. Uh, the fourth element is payments. The challenge for the consumer is even if they've managed to go through the whole funnel previously, uh, if they can't pay with a local payment method or if their credit card is declined because it's international, then they can't purchase. So we solve that pain point by adding lots of payment methods. And then the final one is customer service, so refunds, returns, tracking, um, all of that, and making sure that we can provide that out of the box. Because if a brand wants to go international, whether they're large or small, they don't want to take on half of the pain of it. They want to know that the whole thing is managed by a partner. And then there's, it sort of ties into sort of local marketing to a certain extent as well, right? Yes, yeah, so and local marketing is a very interesting part, and that's where we have to work more closely with our partners because they're experts in their own brands and what works well as a marketing channel. But we have a lot of experience now with how consumers in Canada behave differently from consumers in Austria who behave very differently from um, Chilean consumers. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, our client success team will work closely with them to talk about price points, price rounding, should it end in .88 in Singapore or .00? Should you include sales tax in uh, UK or not? Um, if you're going to run a promotion on Australia, now that they've changed their thresholds, should you make it duty-free or not? Mm -hmm. um, so over time, we find the perfect experience country by country for them. Uh, but on the marketing side, uh, we make advice about which channels work well in which countries. 
And increasingly, we're adding parts to our platform to help them provide localized feeds into Google and Facebook. Um, but oftentimes, the brand needs to be engaged in that to help us make them succeed. When I speak to leaders of, of various brands, um, I think they sometimes feel that they can't afford some of the uh, bells and whistles and tools that the big the big guys have. I mean, you know, Nike always comes up, Burberry, um, you know, any, uh, any of these massive companies that are, are trading around the world, um, Gap, uh, etc. Um, I, f I think that um, what's wonderful about software as a service platforms is the ability to provide the, the community, the cooperative, as it were, uh, and shared tools across many multiple smaller brands um, than, um, than the smaller brands probably realize is available to them. So the question, therefore, is how, at what level, what scale of business uh, should someone start thinking about engaging with Flow and that they indeed too can have some of this, uh, cap these capabilities in their business without maybe necessarily knowing that they can. Yeah, it's a great point. I think not just us, there are plenty of other software solutions, uh, as you say, software as a service or even platform as a service that these brands can access at just subscription rates to allow them to compete with either global brands or the Amazon marketplaces of the world. Um, what we do is engage brands of almost any level. We have brands doing hundreds of millions uh, or multi-billion dollar brands, but sometimes mid-sized brands. And we've even got a handful of startup brands who by definition want to be global from day one. You mentioned earlier the power of social networks. We have many brands who are heavily socially networked or even celebrities who already have an enormous following. And by definition, they think of themselves as global. The, even the concept of being a domestic brand is anathema to them. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a buy button on Instagram is going to be seen in Afghanistan as well as Mexico. And so they need to be able to fulfill demand to the world and not simply a domestic audience. Mm -hmm. So we have many brands who start off at zero and the day they open their doors, they're opening it up to the world. And so um, presumably there are some whiz-bang statistics around uh, what you have done for a brand that's come onto the platform and then you have... Uh, performed your miracles and a year later lo and behold they have reached nirvana so what what give us some of the examples of, of how you have you know increased uh, uh, either visibility conversion and all the other metrics yeah with pleasure so i think there's two parts to how we or uh, platforms can help brands go global one is just localizing the whole site experience making sure that uh, prices are localized local currency nicely rounded duties and tax cheap shipping fast shipping all the payment methods, that helps conversion rates. That means that the 34% site traffic hitting their site on average from international sources will convert at much higher levels than would have otherwise been. Uh, so that's, What is it usually before? I mean, if someone's not optimizing, what, 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 what if it's typically a 2% conversion, 2.5% conversion in your domestic, in your home country, how, how bad it can it be before they come to you? Um, typical for international would be 10 basis points to 50 basis points. Ooh, okay. yeah, yeah, so it's about a fifth to a tenth of domestic. And so that's the scope of opportunity. You've already acquired this traffic. They're already hitting your site. There's no additional marketing needed to convert that. You just need tools to make it feel localized and give them comfort mm -hmm. and address any concerns about trust. Um, so the first part of helping clients is that. The second part is using tools to help them drive traffic to their site because Google and Facebook need, it's quite complicated, but need localized product feeds that um, are matching a landing page in order to serve traffic to them. And the third is something that we can't do immediately. They turn all of this on, but over a period of time, our team will engage them and do different A-B tests and share knowledge about how consumers behave in different markets and test different things. And so across those three levers, we help them improve. Um, recently, I was on stage with the CEO of MC Wallace, and he was talking about 180% lift in their international sales since they started working with us. And they're now in 130 different countries. So they're truly a global brand uh, and generating enormous following in countries you wouldn't expect. So that's an interesting segue into the, the kinds of brands that you work with. Um, can you name a few others and, and, and how, how it's worked for them? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, we work with out and known, they just released a case study. They've doubled their sales. Uh, One of my favorite brands. Oh, is it really? I love it. For working out? 
<laughs> yeah, no oil for pretty much anything. I just think it's just a great brand and, you know, the whole vibe of it's great. Yeah. I mean, a lot of our customers are digital native brands. Yeah. They're brands that really understand international marketing. The idea that their audience would just be domestic is nonsensical to them. And they really get that their segment, whatever it is, millennials who like activewear are identical in uh, New Zealand as they are in Spain and as they are in, in LA. And so if they understand that segment, they understand how to reach them, they know the passion they can develop, uh, they want to be able to reach those consumers. And so we try to partner with them so they reach a 7 billion consumer audience. So there's Altenone, therefore going to, is, is Kelly Slater going to invite all you guys out to the Surf Ranch for your offsite? I think the invitation got lost in the mail. <laughs> I'm sure she wanted to. Um, all right. So, um, and, 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 and any other brands? What other digital natives are you working with? Um, Movement Watches is one of our oldest clients. Uh, fantastic story. Uh, two brilliant founders uh, bootstrapped a brand and sold it to uh, Movement Watch, uh, to Mavada Group uh, last year. Uh, we work with them on their international sales. They're a fantastic example of how to market themselves digitally and how to flex their marketing and positioning country by country uh, and have an enormous international uh, sales pipeline. Uh, and many others. We've got dozens and dozens of clients, not just digital native, but traditional. One of the interesting things that uh, you hinted at earlier is a lot of the businesses, the merchants that are trying to reach a global audience are brands more than retailers. Retailers... There's a strong demand for it. Their brands are well-known internationally, but they have so many challenges domestically that often they can't lift their head up from those challenges to look to the future and growth. Where brands are going over the top, they're strong on marketing, they're increasingly competent uh, on direct-to-consumer marketing, and they think about their audience as global and not have to worry about the retail channels. And so presumably if they're digital native brands, uh, the you, they're relatively small, some of these companies. So, you know, unlike Nike, the, the mega, mega brand, um, it sounds as though people can start plugging in with Flow relatively early on. Very early on. As I said, we have some that is doing it from the first set dollar sold ever, is already global. Others who are just starting out doing a few million international, maybe they only do 50 million domestically. But uh, a good brand, if they optimize their international, could be doing 10, 20, 30% of their sales from overseas. So it's a quick win way of capitalizing on the traffic on your site to turn on a international localization solution. So I, I, um, I, I underlined something in my notes from some of your materials about brand identity must be global. I referenced global brand earlier and, and wanted to touch on it now a little bit. Um, the two words, global and brand, to me uh, and to everyone here at, at Traub is, is not just about uh, crossing borders. It's really about the brand in its globality, in its totality, and how it touches the consumer. Yes, whether it's in a different country, but on any channel of distribution or in any ch channel distribution or through any classification of product, um, there has to be consistency. And, you know, with the world as it is today, people moving around a lot, and, and uh, the idea of having a, a fractured uh, brand identity, particularly online, which is effectively always has to become or will always be store number one, um, because of scale and size, but also brand equity, um, keeping that consistency globally so that you're delivering that same message in all these different markets. Maybe talk about how you help brands do that. Yeah. Um, online, as you said, it's a single storefront. And so even though prices are changing and shipping and payment, um, the brand identity isn't. Um, it's the same site. And in, importantly, a lot of the young brands that we work with it's a single site that we're localizing to 200 countries. We're not setting up 200 different sites, which is quite different from the Nikes of the world who do set up dozens and dozens of different country sites. And that's partly what makes it uh, unaffordable for most brands to merchandise and to inventory for so many different countries and cumbersome for the big global brands. Mm -hmm. And technology has now allowed smaller brands to compete actually more efficiently than them without the need to set up multi-DC inventories, without the need to set up multi-sites and to merchandise and price them differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the access to these brands is much earlier than it was before. So, so let's, let's pull up a little bit to maybe 30,000 feet and talk about the industry at large. Um, you know, we all are in our own little areas of it, uh, maybe, and uh, 
but we all are dealing with, you referenced Instagram. I mean, Instagram's now potentially the biggest, one of the biggest retailers on the planet uh, relatively overnight. I mean, you know, they just put a button and there you go. I know it's not that easy, um, but symbolically, it's just fascinating how these horizontal businesses can suddenly just take over an entire industry or become a meaningful player in it. Um, Amazon, similarly, another horizontal business um, across many different areas of, of expertise, but nonetheless globally trying to, you know, waltz their way around the globe uh, slowly, but effectively in some markets. In China, there's Alibaba and JD and all these big guys. What is your, from your vantage point, when you look at the industry and all those mega players, uh, on the one hand, we're dealing with and talking about the smaller vertical uh, businesses uh, who are not horizontal players like those mega technology companies. Um, how, what is the, in the, the crosshairs of growth over the next five to 10 years? And you're running a company, you're a brand, uh, you have to one day probably make the call, should I go on Amazon, should I not, should I go on JD, should I not? Um, how do you see the balance of power uh, and therefore that playing into the decisions of the executive who's trying to say, well, how much control is realistic? Yeah, I think that's right. I think there's they're looking for an equilibrium between reach, how do I reach a global audience efficiently, uh, to control, how do I have some semblance of a control over my brand and brand equity, uh, and three, economics. How can I do all of this in a way that isn't too erosive on my margins? And so I think some of the platforms that you mentioned are quite different in nature. Instagram, Pinterest, House, even Twitter, as they put up buy buttons, that's great for brands because it's their buy buttons, it's driving to a version of their landing pages, and it gives them that reach, control, and maybe sacrificing a bit of margin, mm -hmm. but not marketplace style margins. Whereas the the T malls on Alibaba and the Amazons, those are commoditizing their front end experience. So you are sacrificing control and margin for reach. And I think increasingly brands are benefiting from those platforms that can give them global reach without being true commerce players in their own right. And I think these other platforms that you mentioned, the kind of Instagrams, Pinterest, even Facebook. I think a lot of value that's built into their valuation is that they can segue easily into commerce. It's not a byproduct uh, afterthought. It was with forethought that with mm -hmm. this match traction and consumer engagement, we can talk them through a trusted consumer purchase um, in a way that brands can't always do themselves. So I think that's a perfect marriage waiting to happen over the next few years. Have you heard of any stories in what you do when... Um a, a client of yours opened up or clicked the switch and opened up a certain territory that um, the the ability of your platform, uh, I know this is a bit of a random question, but um, the, is it, it's always about, you know, bits and bytes and dollars and cents. And we're always talking about sort of the the plumbing, I guess, of how to get mm -hmm. things to people and, 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 the, and the brands to people. But has there been customer feedback from clients, cultural feedback, meaning, you know, the soft stuff? whereby they've said, you know what, it's, I, I, lo I love your site now. It's so wonderful to use it a certain way. Uh, have you had any of that kind of um, custom, actual consumer feedback, I guess, versus customer feedback, because they would be the brands? Yeah, absolutely. We measure that in both qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. On the quantitative side, there are a few measures that are very easy for us to track. One is uh, obviously conversion rates, how much of their site traffic is converting into purchases. And that's a goal that we set ourselves with each brand, what we want to achieve. But also downstream, things like refusals, which is uh, on the doorsteps, the carrier is giving you a package. Mm -hmm. And if they're asking for an extra $30, $40 in duties, taxes, and fees, you may well, and it's within your rights to, refuse the package. So that's another good measure of poor customer experience. And the third is, of course, repeat purchases and lifetime value. So quantitatively, that's how we can measure success and impact relative to doing it very poorly. Qualitatively, we hear it all the time. We see a lot of consumer feedback around clumsy sites, wrong, wrong exchange rates, wrong amounts of duties and taxes charge, surprises and fees on their cards or on the doorstep, and then going to a more frictionless mode where it feels domestic. And our goal is really to persuade consumers, not duplicitously, but the look and feel of the site should feel domestic. We want to get to a place where for all of our many clients, a consumer in France doesn't know that they're not a French site and it feels like they could be based in 
to lose. Does that mean you have to have local the people from the local cultures guide your hand, uh, or is there more ubiquity than we than we know uh, across the across the globe? I think there is much more ubiquity, uh, certainly in language and look and feel. Sites are usually very visual, so uh, as long as they're consistent with the brands, there's no additional localization required. Um, and oftentimes we're exporting for U.S. brands Americana, so there's no need to make it too localized. The site should feel localized enabled, but the brand itself is trying to portray itself as an American brand or a traditional British brand or whatever. So I think they, the brands are specific enough to be able to keep their brand identity as long as they have that plumbing you described to reach that local. So as, as we reach uh, the end of our, our chat, um, if there were a few takeaways that a CEO, president, or head of e-com uh, who's listening to this um, should really be thinking about maybe a frustration that you keep on having to hammer on, you bang your head against the wall. I wish they'd understand this, but they, I take, you know, what is the one or two things um, that uh, you really wish they would uh, they would would know before you showed up uh, to the pitch? Yeah, that that's easy for us. I think how much of your site traffic is already international? These are customers you've effectively acquired. You're just not converting them. Uh, you could increase your size of your business by a third overnight if you just enabled yourself to be international. Two, don't look at your domestic market. There's 7 billion consumers out there, and many of them are identical to your existing customer base. Think of it as a global audience, not as a domestic one with artificial borders, because on the online world, we don't see borders. Mm -hmm. And three, realize that it's not an impossible challenge. There are lots of challenges of going international, but there are one-stop solutions to addressing all of those. And so it really is as simple as integrate and flick a switch. And now you have 7 billion potential consumers out there ready to compete, ready to purchase. And as a smaller brand, if you're not a big global brand yet, there are slingshots out there that allow you to slay Goliaths that may have big, powerful infrastructures, but that can be cumbersome. You're nimble. You can take advantage of platforms as a service. You can go over the top and reach consumers anywhere simply and consistent with your brand equity. So a world without borders. It sounds like John Lennon was a founder of Flow as well somewhere along the way, right? Imagine. <laughs> Imagine that. So thanks so much, Rob, for, for joining me on the safari. Now, it's just such a pleasure to you know, be able to, as I said before, talk to people who know so much about uh, parts of the industry that, um, frankly, uh, many executives uh, are still learning. So um, I'm, I'm, I learned a lot from this, and um, I know many others have as well. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Morty. Much appreciated. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. We pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage, and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry. And it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it.